today I will be going over the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship Program, which is commonly abbreviated as the NSF GRFP. And I am currently a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz, and I was awarded an NSF GRFP Fellowship in 2014. So the purpose of the NSF GRFP is to provide three years of funding for graduate education to people who have demonstrated their potential for significant achievements in science and engineering. The NSF GRFP is actually not geoscience specific. It supports over 100 subdisciplines, including social sciences and psychology, as well as the hard sciences. Uh, so the NSF GRFP actually has a couple of different benefits that make it a super useful opportunity to pursue. It, includes in total over $130,000 um, of a funding package. It's awarded over five years. Three of these years are paid. And the three years that are paid provide direct stipend support to the fellow at $34,000. On top of this, there is a supplementary cost of education allowance that's $12,000 annually. And this typically goes straight to the institution and how it's used can be institution specific. Some schools return a fraction of the annual award back to each fellow, while other schools take it in whole to offset school tuition and fee costs. A number of internship opportunities also exist for NSF fellows, um, and one of these is actually exclusive to NSF GRFP fellows. Uh, this would be NSF GRIP, and it basically allows you to do uh, internships that are three months to 12 months in length at uh, state and federal agencies. It also comes with an additional small stipend to allow for relocation expenses during the time of the internship. And these opportunities are super amazing ways to collaborate with new scientists that could even open up future doors for career employment after graduation. There are several ways to apply for NSF GRFP. Uh, new rules, relatively new rules, have kind of limited the times graduate students can apply. And so this is pretty important to note. Uh, so if you apply as a graduate student, you're really only eligible to apply once, whether you're a first year student or second year student. Uh, and the exception to this would be if you have a master's degree and you take a couple of years off before applying again. But most commonly students apply during their first or second years of graduate school. And because if, and if you apply as a graduate student, like I said, you can only apply once. Alternatively, if you apply as an undergraduate senior, or uh, prior to entering graduate school, you actually can apply twice. First, while you're an undergraduate, and second, once you um, enter graduate school. And so this is really what I recommend for, I really recommend taking advantage of this first pathway. You know, the best case scenario is that you're awarded the fellowship, and the worst case is that your application is unsuccessful as an undergraduate. Either way, you're gonna be gaining a lot of valuable feedback through the process, and you really set yourself up for a stronger application once you enter graduate school. So you may be wondering how many people actually apply for this fellowship. Uh, well, because it covers over 100 subdisciplines, the applications generally exceed uh, over 12,000. And I think this number's actually been growing recently. Uh, and so of these 12,000 people that apply, they typically award about 2,000 fellowships each year. And uh, in 2020, if we look at the geoscience specific disciplines, uh, typically around uh, 100 fellowships of the 2,000 that are awarded go to geoscience specific subdisciplines. In 2019, it was pretty similar, around 95 fellowships awarded to geoscience specific fields of study. Uh, and so then breaking down these award numbers, uh, each, so when you apply for an SFGRFP in the geosciences, you actually have to select a subdiscipline. And so these are the award offers by geoscience subdiscipline for 2019 and 2020. And so while there's some variability year to year, generally uh, marine biology probably receives the greatest percentage of applications every year and thus gets funded the most out of all of these subdisciplines in geosciences. Uh, the timeline for NSF GRFP is actually pretty consistent year to year. Uh, I don't think it actually changed much since I applied back in 2014. So in July, program solicitations are released, and this is where you're going to find the formal requirements for uh, applying and guidelines and essay prompts, basically. And in August, the applications formally open, so this is when you can actually start submitting your materials. And the deadlines typically fall in late October, uh, and the deadlines are sub -discipl or discipline specific, so you really need to pay attention to those 
uh, deadlines. And there's kind of a lag between your application submission and receiving award notification, which comes out in early April every year. Uh, so there are a few key components to consider when applying for the NSF GRFP or key compo components of the application rather. The application requires two statements and these two statements are what you will primarily be judged upon. So it's really important to pay attention to what goes into these statements. The first statement is the personal statement, relevant background and future goals. And it has a three page limit. So this statement is where you will describe your background and life experience as well as your future goals. And the research statement is complimentary and it's a two page research proposal. It's basically a pro it's it's going to be detailing a project that you've come up with. It could be an extension of research you've assisted with as an undergraduate. Alternatively, if you are a first or second year graduate student, this is probably going to be an outline of a project you're currently working on or you're planning to complete during your studies. And so the these statements are judged on two merit review criteria that you should become intimately familiar with if you're going to apply to this fellowship. The first is broader impacts. And so reviewers really want to know how is your research going to benefit society? How are you personally going to advance societal outcomes? And here I would think about broad level and tangible benefits. Uh, for example, are you committed to outreach programs? The second is intellectual merit. So how is your research going to advance science? Reviewers really want to see if you're uh, able to connect your ideas to bigger picture benefits. Um, and so really keeping an eye on how your, your statements address these two merit review criteria is critical. And in fact, applications now must include separate headings for each within uh, either both statements or one or the other. And so finally, the NSF GRFP application requires two letters of recommendation, although three is recommended. So a few pieces of advice for a su successful application. Uh, the first is to find an interesting hook or storyline for your personal statement that's going to resonate throughout your personal statement and your research statement. Each reviewer probably reads over 30 applications, maybe even more, and your job is really to make uh, their life easy and maybe even an enjoyable experience. So I'd really think long and hard about your narrative and how to weave your life and research experiences into it. It'll really pay off. I also recommend starting early. So the sooner you start, the more feedback you can solicit from mentors and peers. Uh, I remember attending a microbiology roundtable as a geoscientist and the feedback on my essays was so valuable from an outsider's perspective. It made me really think about, you know, what elements in my research proposal were necessary. And, um, you know, it's important to remember that your reviewers are not necessarily specialists in your topic. And so really avoiding technical jargon is uh, an important element of your application as well. And finally, I recommend uh, finding explicit examples that highlight your skill sets. The NSF GRFP funds the person and not the project. And really, people want to know, are you qualified and is your project well reasoned? And so with that, there are also a few pitfalls to avoid with this application. Uh, like I mentioned, reviewers read a lot of these and it's important that they get to know you and they only have five pages of essay material to do that. So you need to take advantage of the limited space that you have and be as explicit as possible. Show um, instead of saying. So for example, instead of saying I'm a passionate scientist or I've always been interested in you know, hydrology or biogeochemistry, it's important that you show, you show this. So provide a compelling example um, based on your volunteer research or life experiences. You have to find a way to tell a story, right? Instead of uh, saying explicitly, I'm a passionate, you know, hydrologist. Uh, I would also like to emphasize the importance of adequately characterizing or addressing the broader impacts merit criteria. Oftentimes people underestimate the importance of this section and uh, you need to find outreach initiatives you're passionate about now if you haven't. Reviewers really want to see that you're going to execute your broader impact goals and the best way to convince reviewers of this is to have direct experience going into the application and to be really clear about what your future goals will be.
Uh, finally, I'd, I'd just like to emphasize that you should take advantage of all of the resources online to better your application. There are so many tips and guides uh, that'll help you structure your essays and uh, tons of examples to help you curate better content and to see examples of successful um, statements. And, you know, proofread, proofread, and proofread again. Uh, you don't want to lose points for basic uh, writing issues. And fo follow directions, follow the guidelines that NSF puts out. And so finally, here are a few links to useful websites with more information. The NSF GRFP website is the place to go for application tutorials, information about deadlines, and for tips. And I've also included a couple of links to personal web pages that have a ton of great tips and a number of example essays or statements. So I recommend checking all of these out. And with that, I will take a couple of questions. Great, thanks, Christina. Um, I have one question here. What was the most difficult part of preparing your application? And do you have any advice for how you overcame that? Yeah, so I think the most difficult part for me was trying to find a compelling way to tell my um, kind of life experiences and research experiences and catching the reader in that first paragraph. And it took a lot of revisions and a lot of feedback from other people. So I would just say, you know, find a support system. And really the best thing you can do is, is get a lot of critical reviews on your essays early so that you can build a stronger application once it's due. Great, thanks for that. Um, we have a question here about letters of recommendation. Uh, do you have any advice on who should be included or solicited to provide those letters of recommendation beyond, say, university faculty? Right, uh, okay, so the first choice would be obviously professors or people you might have taken classes with or current advisors. And then secondary to that, I actually had a boss. I worked at USGS at the time and I had um, my boss at the time write me one of my letters of recommendation. So that's definitely a feasible alternative if you are able to get three letters from professors. Uh, but I would typically recommend trying to get at least two probably from people directly in academia. 